Please welcome Tom Rascal. Good afternoon, everyone. Same with the inflection, justice for animals, justice for animals, because I want this to be a question that we try to answer. It's possible that we won't get to the bottom of it today. It's possible that we won't all agree with each other. My hope is that you will leave here having thought more seriously about some of the choices that we Americans and humans generally tend to make with respect to animals. I should add, I neglected to tell Paul this, I should add that my real claim to fame is that I am a Democracy Summer alumnus of sorts. I love it, and the work that you all are doing is absolutely indispensable. So thank you for what you're doing. We're going to be talking about rights today. What is a right? Can someone help me out? What's a right? Yeah. not to be tortured. What does that mean? Right. Yeah, it's something that cannot be done to me. Yeah. I cannot be tortured. I think that the work of politics is a work of trying to reconcile different rights claims. This is something that all of you have probably familiarized yourself with very well by this there are people who say that we have a right to health care. There are other people who say we have one right, which is a set of property rights. We have a set of property rights, and it is wrong for the government ever to compel us to pay for somebody else's health care. On the one hand, we have somebody who says, I have a right to health care. On the other hand, we have somebody who says, I have a right not to have my money taken. These rights might conflict. And what we have to do is determine what sort of rights claims make sense to us. So let's take a step back for a moment. See, we have a little table right here. Everyone see this? Suppose I came in here today and I said, I want rights for tables. This table has a right not to be tortured. Who here would think that that makes sense? Raise your hand. <laughs> yeah? You would say the table could last longer. Right. I'm sorry. Well, I think the reason that we're asking these questions, what would torturing a table consist of, for example, what would it look like to torture a table, is that a table doesn't care what we do to it. Sure? It's true that if we don't use it for all sorts of shenanigans, like beating it up with a baseball bat, it'll last longer. But that doesn't mean that we're doing an injustice to the table. Will you all agree with me there? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Now let's think of real injustices. Even if you don't know exactly why they're injustices, just think to yourselves for a moment. When you think of injustice, what historical event, for example, comes to mind? Just think. Oh, yes, I see that some have already come in mind. Yes? Um, um, the Uh huh. Yes. The Holocaust. Everyone has been a victim of stand your ground laws before us. I'm sorry. Trail of Tears? why we would count these as injustices. 
Now, one potential reason that the Rwandan genocide and slavery and the Trail of Tears and the Holocaust count as injustices is that we burn and kill live beings when we did this. When I say we did this, I mean when humanity perpetrated the mass extermination of the Jewish people and subjected people from Africa to slavery and subjected indigenous people to the Trail of Tears, we people, we mutilated them, we tortured them, and we killed them. But the fact that they were live beings, I don't think quite explains the injustice of what occurred. Plants are living beings. When we rip up and burn plants, I don't think that we're committing an injustice. I don't think that most people do think that. And I think for good reason, most people would not think that it's an injustice to tear up plants. Now, it might be an injustice to the person who owns the plants, but we wouldn't say that it's an injustice to the plants themselves. The reason for that, I would suggest, not to get ahead of myself, but the reason for it is that plants, like the table, don't feel pain. There are going to be people who claim that they do. Every botanist that I've encountered, every plant ethicist has suggested that plants don't feel pain, just in the way that this table doesn't feel pain. Okay, so it wasn't that we subjected living things to grisly mutilations and torture. Maybe the way we explain the injustices that you all enumerated is that we subjected smart beings to mutilation and torture and dispossession and plunder. A lot of people who died in the Holocaust were very well educated. These were individuals who had gotten education, who had been through tough jobs, who knew how to do calculus. Well, that probably gets us a little bit closer to the truth, but then there were people who suffered during the Holocaust and during slavery and during the Trail of Tears who weren't mathematicians or philosophers or scientists or writers. There were babies who died during the Holocaust. There were severely cognitively impaired people who died during all of the atrocities that you all named. We would not think that just because they were incapable of writing, for example, or doing math, that they didn't suffer an injustice. Do we all agree with that? Okay. Then we come to the question of animals animals that we eat regularly. 8 billion chickens, 300 million turkeys, 100 million pigs, and 20 million cows are slaughtered every year in the United States of America for humans' palate pleasure. One sec. The question that I would ask First is, are these beings capable of experiencing pain? And most biologists, I'd say that the biological scientific consensus at this point is that the animals that we routinely brutalize and mutilate and humiliate for our pleasure feel pain. Before we proceed, let me just say this. We're going to be talking about some grisly stuff today, as I'm sure you picked up by now. And my effort here, my intention is not to shame anybody or to make anybody feel bad. It's also not to be dogmatic. I'm not here to say that I'm right and those who disagree with me are wrong. In fact, I hope that I'm wrong. I hope that somehow we can justify the brutalization of 8 billion chickens, 300 million turkeys, 100 million pigs, 20 million cows, and all of the aquatic life that we subject to suffering every year. If you can put forth an argument that makes
makes sense, and I'll be thrilled. But I'm proceeding with the assumption that because these beings experience pain, it is wrong for us, for insignificant gains, to subject them to the torture that we currently subject them to. Suppose that Donald Trump came in here tomorrow. And unfortunately, I fear this is not too far from reality. It's not reality, but it's not too far from it. Suppose he came in here and said, starting now, members of the Trump family have a right not to be tortured and killed. But all non-members of the Trump family have no such right. And we protest, we say, that's unfair, Mr. President, how dare you? What conceivable justification could you put forth for granting rights just to people in your family? And he says, only people in the Trump family live in the White House. And we would be taken aback, I think. That doesn't make sense, right? There are two points that we would make. First of all, not everyone in the Trump family does live in the White House, right? Last I checked, Eric's not living there. I don't think Don Jr. is living there. I don't think Ivanka's moved in yet. Barron's there, Melania's there, but not every member of the Trump family is in the White House. And he says, okay, that's true. Not, ever, not every member of the Trump family is in the White House, but they're all related to people who live in the White House. And we would say, well, you're trying to prove the moral significance of living, or rather, of being a member of the Trump family. You're trying to prove to us that what one's family membership is should dictate how you're treated. So we'd say that doesn't make sense. But let's suppose for a moment that every member of the Trump family lived in the White House. We would say, what's the relevance? Who cares? Because they live in the White House, they have a right not to be tortured, and we don't have that right? We'd say that's absurd. Why do I give you this hypothetical? Well, I think of humans as a family. In fact, we are. We have common ancestors. In fact, I think of all animals as part of one family. Humans and chimpanzees have an ancestor who lived probably five million years ago. Placental mammals those who nourish embryos with a placenta have a common ancestor who lived about 100 million years ago, maybe a little bit less than that. Humans and chickens have a common ancestor who probably lived about 310 million years ago. Sometimes you'll hear people say, why are we mistreating animals like this? They're our cousins. They are our cousins. There's something to that. I have first cousins with whom I share grandparents. I have second cousins with whom I share great grandparents. I have third cousins with whom I share great great grandparents. When you keep on going like that, eventually you'll get a pretty big family reunion and you'll get chimpanzees there. Because when you go far back enough, we are related. So somebody comes forth, and this is the argument I always get for human rights and not animal rights. Someone comes forth and says, Humans have a right not to be tortured and killed because we all possess X characteristic. I'm going to ask you all to think of what that characteristic could be for a moment. And you don't have to agree with me or disagree with me. But when I say, or when somebody says to you, humans are different from animals, what characteristic comes to your mind? What thing do we all have that animals don't? Speech? Sentience. Capability for labor. A justice system. A justice system. Yeah. I mean, not all humans have speech. Like there are people who have cognitive issues who don't have cognitive speech. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. The ability to plan ahead. Ability to plan ahead. Intelligence. Civilization. Civilization. Yeah. So, <laughs> self consciousness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The extensive use of tools. Extensive use of tools. Interesting. Um, I, something I used to believe, but uh -huh. I don't think I believe anymore, is um, a superior. 
superior capability of emotions and feelings. Mm -hmm. Economy. Economy, yeah. Okay. All right. All good answers. And these are often the answers that we get. People say, of course humans have rights unlike the rights that should be afforded to animals. Humans are able to speak. Humans are able to make tools and use those tools. Humans are able to build beautiful buildings like this one. I think it's beautiful. <laughs> I also hear that humans are moral agents. Humans are able to differentiate right from wrong. I often hear that humans are able to do math. I don't know of any sentient non-humans that can do calculus. Okay, what's your name? Amy? Yes. Lily. Sorry to call you out, Lily. So Lily says, and I think she's right, that actually not all humans are able to speak. Babies can't. There are people with severe cognitive impairments who can't. Not all people are moral agents. That is, not all people are able to differentiate right from wrong. There are people with schizophrenia who are so overwhelmed by delusions and hallucinations that they're not able to differentiate good from bad. So they can't really tell what's going on. Not all humans can do math. Some of the humans that I named before would be in those categories. Now, some of you, and when I say you, I don't mean people in this audience, but others would say, well, it's true that babies aren't able to speak, but they belong to a species that can. They belong to a family that is capable of speech. Therefore, they deserve rights, whereas animals don't. To which my response is the response that we would give Donald Trump when he says, it's true that not all members of the Trump family live in the White House, but they're related to people who live in the White House. The answer is you're trying to prove the moral significance of belonging to the Trump family. You can't assume from the outset that your conclusion is true. That's called circular reasoning. If y'all have taken logic yet, learn about circular reasoning. In order to prove that your conclusion is true, you have to begin with a premise that does not assume that the conclusion is true. And that's what Donald Trump is doing. And that's what these people who say that humans who can't speak have rights are doing when they say that these humans belong to a family that is able to speak. But suppose it were true for a moment. Suppose it were true that all humans could speak that all humans were able to do math, that all humans were able to design beautiful buildings. The question we would then ask, which is the question that we would ask Donald Trump is, what's the significance? He says that if you're a member of the Trump family, you have a right not to be tortured. What does being a member of the Trump family have to do with a right not to be tortured? By the same token, what does being a member of the human family with an ability to speak have to do with the right not to be tortured? What if I came here today and I said, my proposal is that in order to get a driver's license, you need to know how to swim. That wouldn't make much sense, would it? What does getting a driver's license have to do with your abilities in a swimming pool? The question is not, can animals speak? We might want to determine if they can speak before we let them onto the speech team, but if we're trying to determine whether or not to torture them, whether they can speak is wholly irrelevant. The same is true for their ability to make moral claims. In the same way that we would think that human babies have a right not to be tortured, even though they're not able to speak, we must also believe that animals that are not able to speak
have a right not to be tortured. Yeah, you have a question? So, um, I'm like really pen vegan, and I yeah. totally agree with you on all these topics, yeah. but I've often found that when I try and bring this stuff up to people, yeah. mm -hmm. I'm always disregarded or as the young girl that my opinion isn't important because I'm just too sympathetic that you, you just haven't seen real life yet. Mm. And I'm, people won't listen to me, and I'm often, people are so, they cling so tightly to their beliefs that they will never actually do it. How do you try and deal with it? Like, how do you get people to like actually open up to that and have a conversation? Because I've, I've given up, really, in trying to talk to people because I've been really disrespected for the past couple of years. First, I'm sorry that you've okay. been disrespected. Yeah. I hope I can change your mind. I hope we can all change your mind. I hope that you won't give up because we need you to speak about it. Really, the animals need you to speak about it. Look, I've spent most of my life believing that animals don't have rights. Why would I have thought that animals have rights? All of my teachers, all of the religious leaders I encountered, all of the celebrities I encountered, all of the people I heard on the radio, all of the political candidates I saw in debate suggested either that animals have no interests or that they do have interests, but they're not worth respecting. People say to you, you're just too sympathetic. First of all, there's nothing wrong with being sympathetic. I suggest that you all would not be here unless you were sympathetic. If you didn't feel that it was necessary to try to affect change on behalf of those who are not necessarily able to do it all by themselves, if you didn't have sympathy for them, then you wouldn't be here. There's nothing wrong with being sympathetic. We need sympathetic people. But I will say that for me, what convinced me to change was an assessment of the evidence and formal discussion or series of discussions on the logic that leads to veganism. I think that animal liberation, the claim that animals have rights, is a matter of, as I said before, reconciling conflicting impulses that one has. People said to me, do you support rights for babies? I said, of course I support rights for babies. How could I not? Everyone does, right? They're babies, they're innocent, they haven't done anything to anyone. Do you support rights for cognitively impaired people? Of course I do. Okay, and then they say to me, all right, well, what characteristic do those humans possess that animals lack that could conceivably justify giving rights to one and not the other? I didn't have a good answer to that. I think that when you're willing to engage with people in a discussion regarding the logic of it, they come to see it. Now there's some people I've encountered who are vegan just because they feel it's wrong to kill animals. They watch a video of the slaughterhouse, as some of you may have done before, and they're just disgusted by it and they say they want to have nothing to do with it. And that's good enough for me. If that will turn you vegan, then I'm gonna support you. But there's some people who need a little more product. And I ask the question of you that I ask of everyone. If, if this doesn't seem right, that is, if my logic is not aligning, then where exactly are we going wrong? Yes, my friend. Um, so I'm sure you've heard this before. Yeah. But um, so if a cheetah hunts a gazelle, does that mean the cheetah is infringing more than gazelles, right? Very good. Okay. This is one of the primary arguments out there, which is basically an attempt to show that animals aren't perfect. That's true. Do you mind if I take what you've said? This is very unfair of me. And use it for my purposes to address two related arguments. Is that okay? Sure. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Here's one thing that you'll often hear. Omnivores eat other animals. Therefore, in a sense, omnivores deserve to be tortured and eaten themselves. 
that is, if you have one animal, if you have animal A attacking animal B in a very disgusting manner, then animal, B, animal A rather has forfeited its right not to be tortured itself. There's nothing speciesist or discriminatory or prejudiced about that. That's just justice, right? All right, let's take a step back, though. First, let's start with the carnivore, actually. Let's talk about the lion attacking the gazelle. I think you said cheetah, but let's, let's lion, okay, so. <laughs> lion attacks a gazelle, all right. There are two things you gotta understand. One, a lion does not have a developed moral sense the way you do, or the way that I do. And people will seize on that and say, aha, that proves that they don't have rights. Well, hold on. There was this very sad case in 2000 of a first grader stealing his uncle's gun, going to school, and shooting one of his classmates. This was one six-year-old killing another six-year-old. Even the most staunch, most devout, retributive thinkers in America, I suggest, would not think that it's appropriate to execute this six-year-old boy who did something so egregious to one of his peers. The reason for that is that a six-year-old doesn't necessarily understand the ramifications or the likely ramifications of what he or she is doing in any particular moment. This individual doesn't have a developed moral sense. The same is true of the lion. The lion does not have a developed moral sense. So I don't think it makes sense, if we're going to be consistent, for us to say we should execute the lion if we're not willing to say we're going to execute the six-year-old. I realize you have a response at the ready. Just wait one sec. Okay. There's an additional point that should be made. If we're dealing with a carnivore that kills other animals, that carnivore, I would suggest to you, is even less culpable than a six-year-old, like the boy who shot his peer. Because although he doesn't understand the difference between right and wrong, there wasn't somebody with a gun to his head saying, you have to do this. Whereas if you're a carnivore, in order to survive, you need to kill other animals. It's as though you're walking around with a gun to your head all the time, Somebody's saying to you, if you don't kill, then you're going to die yourself. This is not to say that I take wildlife suffering lightly. I think there are some vegans who shy away from this point. I don't. If it were possible for us to reduce wildlife suffering, perhaps by developing vegan alternatives, for carnivores, as some scientists are actually trying to do, then I would support it. But even if we can't do that, we still have an obligation ourselves not to engage in a despicable activity. The fact that we are not able to address abuses everywhere in the world, in various parts of Asia and Europe and Latin America, doesn't mean that we get to do whatever we want here in the United States by disrespecting the rights of individuals here. That's one form of the animals do it to argument. Here's the second form that I get. People say, look, if a shark is willing to eat a fish, then we should be willing to eat fish. Well, that doesn't make a lot of sense now, does it? If there are gay people being oppressed in Chechnya. Does that mean that we're allowed to oppress gay people? I don't think so. There are individuals who are subjected to genital mutilation in different parts of the world. Does the fact that they're being subjected to those abuses mean that we're allowed to go over there, kidnap the children that are subjected to those abuses and treat them as they are being treated? No. If somebody came to us and said, how do you justify it? And we said, we justify it on the grounds that others are doing it, we'd be laughed out of the room. 
I think that makes sense. Wow, we have a lot of thoughts here. Okay. <laughs> Either you guys are really feeling this, or you think I'm totally <laughs> off my rocker. We'll find out in a moment. Yes? So, my dad's a vet, so I've grown up in a yeah. hospital. It's very much different. But I just wanted to ask, you brought up, with your, you brought up vegan uh, alternatives for carnivores. Yes. A, wouldn't that greatly mess with the ecosystem? And B, also, I feel like a, reason pe- a lot of reason that people don't necessarily listen to a lot of arguments like this is because we're a culture very much so focused on just eating food. participating in this program, I suggest you're doing it for moral reasons. We need moral arguments. Maybe we disagree, maybe not. I'm not saying you and I disagree. No, I'm just saying generally there's some people who say we shouldn't be making moral arguments. If you're in the business of trying to change the United States, you're in the business of trying to end gun violence, you're in the business of trying to get people out of jail, for nonviolent drug offenses, I think you gotta make moral arguments. I am not committed, just with respect to this point about intervening in the ecosystem. I'm not necessarily committed to that. I'm saying, in theory, it would make sense, but in any event, it's irrelevant. This is what I try to impress upon you. It's irrelevant when it comes time for us to determine what our obligation I agree that intervening in different ecosystems can be difficult in the same way that I'm opposed generally to intervening in societies in which mass human rights abuses are occurring. People went into Iraq and into Libya in 2003 and 2011 respectively on the grounds that Saddam Hussein and Muammar Gaddafi were committing human rights abuses, which was true. But I think that they fail to appreciate what I'm sure you appreciate, which is that when you intervene, sometimes you end up producing more hardship than you're actually eliminating. It's a point I'm totally sympathetic to. Now we return to what humans are doing. And I see a lot of people who could do without animal products who aren't. We're not going to totally transform the nature of the human genome or totally destroy human civilization if we go vegan. And there are reams of data to back up that point, and I'd be happy to share that with anyone who's interested. Oh my gosh, where can we begin? Okay. Yes, my friend. to respect the rights of animals, we're going to have to transform our economic system, too. Because, as you're rightly pointing out, there are a lot of people living in food deserts, for example, that are not able to get the vegan food they need. By the way, for what it's worth, that is not a justification for people who can go vegan not to go vegan. I know that's not what anyone here is doing, but sometimes I'll encounter people who... I dare say, have enough money to go vegan, who will say, there are poor people who can't do it. I say, okay, that's true. What about you? You're not a poor person, you can do it. I'll start there. I will continue by saying that although it is true that it is difficult for a lot of people to go vegan, I think to some extent, at least, this has been exaggerated 
by those who are intent on keeping all people addicted to animal products. This is not to say that there are not difficulties, and if we're serious about liberating all sentient beings, human and non-human alike, then we have to be concerned with our economic system. But I maintain that there are some people who say it's too hard for me to go vegan. Or in four, we're doing pretty well, and who really just don't want to do it. They say bacon tastes too good. They say that hamburgers are delicious. Well, guess what? Oppression sometimes does taste good for the oppressor, doesn't it? You, yeah, my friend, go for it. changing their behavior. You know if you can do it. I think you all are moral individuals. I think that you're receptive to arguments about justice. If you can't do it, you can't do it. There are other ways that you can help. And one way is to try to, as I said, alter an economic system that makes it difficult for people to be vegan. But when I was saying that there's some people who make excuses, what I meant to convey is that we are often told by those who are toadies for the meat industry that it's very difficult to eat an affordable vegan diet. I think it can be difficult, but there are folks committed to making it much less difficult. And there are people who have entire calendars and cookbooks about how to eat great tasty vegan food for a very small amount of money. Uh, one additional point here. This is not the spirit in which anybody who intends the point that you're making are making it in. But it's often the case that people will try to portray veganism as if it were an elitist undertaking for those who have too much time. And let me tell you, my friends, people who know real injustice, people like Isaac Bashevis Singer, a Holocaust survivor, who said that to the animals, all humans are Nazis. To them, life is an eternal Treblinka. To people like Dick Gregory, well-known civil rights activist who compared the oppression of animals to the enslavement of black people in the United States, to people like Angela Davis and Rosa Parks, to people like Alex Hershaft, a Holocaust survivor with whom I've met, who says that his experiences in the Warsaw Ghetto inspired him to fight for the animals, to people like these individuals, there's no question that to support carnism, to support the consumption of animal products, is to support a truly brutal, truly odious, truly heinous and destructive and environmentally disastrous system. Yeah. I have two questions. Yes. My first question is, what about the food chain? Um, and my second question is, isn't there sort of a middle ground where people that don't want to give up dairy and animal products can find a way to support ethical farming um, and there's a way to reform that industry but without completely you know forcing everyone who can and is able to give it up without forcing everyone who can and is able to give it up there's a lot of talk these days of so-called humane slaughter 
people ask me if I could support Julian Slaughter. I say I could. There are three things you'd have to prove to me, though. One, you'd have to prove that it's actually humane. In most cases, it's not. The chickens that are subjected to so-called humane processes are de-beaked. The turkeys will sometimes have their snoods cut off. Pigs will have their testicles ripped out without anesthetic. That's not humane, but you'll find that in some humane facilities, that's what occurs. This I view largely as a marketing ploy used to dupe kind, sympathetic people, like the people in this room, to continue to participate in something that is truly condemnable. That's number one. You'd have to prove to me that it's actually humane. Two, you'd have to prove to me that the animals would not bemoan the absence of their friends and their relatives who are killed. We know that when cows have their babies taken from them, the cows will moan out for their babies for days afterwards. That's what happens in the dairy industry. Just as an aside, people ask why do we have to give up milk? Because what happens is that cows are kept perpetually pregnant so they're constantly lactating. And once they actually give birth, the boys are sent right to the slaughterhouse. The girls, if they're deemed excess, will be sent to the slaughterhouse. If not, they will have to endure what their mother endures, which is truly grueling. So you'd have to show me that animals would not lament the absence of their loved ones who are taken away. OK, suppose you could prove both those things to me. Then the third thing you'd have to prove is that animals don't have an interest in the future. This is an important point, and I'm glad that you asked it, or I'm glad you asked the question that led me to this point. Suppose we have a guy named Joe. Joe is a human like us. Unfortunately, he doesn't have any loved ones, but he's got plans, and he's walking down the street one day, and somebody, totally painlessly, comes up behind him and kills him. He's not scared, doesn't experience any physical shock, doesn't experience any trauma. He's just living one moment, and then he dies the next. So there's not really a right answer here. Just think for a moment. Would it be an injustice to Joe to be killed painlessly in that way? Raise your hand if you say yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. And what about individuals who say no? It's not an injustice. Okay. And look, there are actually some people who agree with the no position. Some people who have an argument to make. There's a guy named Epicurus, a famous philosopher who said that death is nothing to us. For when we are, it is not. And when it is, we are not. If I'm walking down the street one day, somebody comes up behind me and kills me totally painlessly, what have I lost? I didn't know that I was getting killed. I didn't experience any shock or trauma. Here's my problem with that argument. Joe, or anyone in this room, if killed painlessly, would have wanted to live to see another day. You all had plans. Joe had plans. Maybe he didn't have friends yet, but maybe he wanted to make friends. <laughs> maybe he wanted to paint a picture. Maybe he wanted to write a book. So I think that it is an injustice to him. There's one additional point before we get too far off track. You see how I love these diversions? Just master of the diversions. Well, I just love this. Okay. For those who say it's not an injustice, suppose that we have somebody who's going through excruciating pain, who says he or she or they want to die. Because this pain cannot be treated without death. And then the doctor finally kills this person. Would you say that this person is better off for having died? 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd say yes. But if you're willing to grant that that person is better off for having died, then I think you have to grant that a happy person who wants to keep living is worse off for having died. That's my objection to Epicurus' argument. Then we come back to animals. The relevant question for me is, can animals conceive of themselves in the future? There are some people, even some animal rights activists, who say, probably not. They say that animals live in what some have called an eternal present. They just go from one moment to the next, not really thinking about what happened before, not thinking about what's going to happen. They're just going from one moment to another. For what it's worth, I find that hard to believe. It could be true. I find it hard to believe. There are some studies that have been conducted showing that if pigs are given dirty food, even when they're really hungry, they'll go wash off the food before they eat it. What does that suggest? It's not entirely clear, but what it could suggest is that the pig is willing to subordinate a present craving in order to be healthy in the long term or in order to eat good food in the long term. When the pig washes off the food, the pig, it very well could be, is planning ahead. People are gonna refute this evidence. We can go back and forth on it. I will say, those are the three things you'd have to prove to me before I could get behind humane slaughter. One, that it's actually humane. Two, that you're not taking these individuals away from their families and that their families are not grieving. Three, that the individuals in question, even if they have no families, even if they're killed painlessly, you'd have to show that they don't have an interest in the future. Wow. What are we going to do? Okay. Well, you didn't answer yep. our question, by the way. Oh, right. What was it? Well, if you can't find a specific reason, you could see that. Yeah. The channels that I see are not um, the hardest food chain. They are fast food chains. Yeah. But so it's not look, distracting me. If you don't mind, what's your name, my friend? Juliana. Juliana, when you say what about the food chain, what do you mean exactly? Well, I was thinking in part of the example with the cheetah and the gazelle. So to give a cheetah or wildlife carnivores like a vegan alternative, wouldn't that disrupt the ecosystem? And aren't humans made in part to eat meat? I know that overbreeding and factory farming is an issue, but isn't it in Would it be unfair to the cheetah, too? Let's start yeah. here. Okay, let's, let's start. Okay. Okay, look, let's start with the cheetah point. What I said there, which is what I said about intervening in Saddam Hussein's Iraq, or intervening in Muammar Gaddafi's Libya, is that I would need to be convinced that it would actually work. If not, then we shouldn't do it. In any event, that doesn't justify. That is, our failure to do it there does not justify our unwillingness to treat animals with the respect that they deserve. You say humans have a natural inclination to eat meat, yeah, it could be true. I think humans also have a natural inclination to be really violent. When they get really mad to get into fights with each other. That doesn't mean we should do it. We have a moral sense. I think a lot of morality is about placing a premium on what is right over what feels good. To return to the point about bacon tasting good and hamburgers taste good, yes. That could be true. Just because it feels good, that doesn't mean it's right. Yeah. Okay, so uh, this might come across somewhat stupid, but I'm, I'm not going to argue with your logic because it's sound enough for me. Um, <laughs> well, thank you, my friend. I appreciate it. <laughs> What's your name? Walter. Walter, yeah. I'm going to take a slightly different stance. Yes. Um, so, obviously, you've, like, donated a lot of your life to service, um, and you seem to be very aware of these issues, but at what point do you give yourself a moral break? Because you come in here and talk to us about sort of like how we're all, you know, presumably advocating for these injustices within human society, but we're ignoring this great injustice. But then like, what if someone came to you and said like, and this is just an assumption, like, Oh, that those clothes you're wearing, that's also a product of injustice. Why aren't you using your privilege to try and boycott that, those injustices? Um, so 
The boycott question is one that I've gotten a lot, actually. Boycotts I view as tactics. They're not inherently good or inherently bad. There are cases in which we should absolutely boycott immoral companies. But there are other cases in which the workers, who theoretically we would be boycotting for, don't want us to boycott. This is a tactical question. But when people come to me saying, the workers at X company are calling for a boycott, will you participate? If I'm convinced that it'll work, then I will participate. Absolutely. Which I suppose brings me to your original question, which is, at what point do I just say, I can't focus on everything, so I'm not going to participate in these boycotts. I'm not going to try to change things. I don't know that there's a particularly compelling answer or a straightforward answer to that question. I came here today to talk to you all because you're clearly passionate about affecting some change on the basis of your ideals, right? You wouldn't be here if that weren't the case. You're taking all the time that you could be spending at the beach or hanging out at home with your friends or watching TV to come here seven or eight hours a day, whatever it is, in order to learn about how to change the world for the better. I'm speaking to you because I think that this is a moral claim to which you all would be receptive. And it's a claim to which you all should be receptive. I would not push myself, nor would I ask you to push yourselves such that you are not able to be happy yourselves. Right? If you're not able to be happy yourselves, one, I think that you're being unjust to yourselves. Your happiness matters too. Two, if you're not happy, it's going to be very difficult to serve others. Both matter. I wish not to refer to you merely as means to an end, as instruments that we can use in order to serve others. I think we are all that, but you also have your own happiness, and that matters. I find, though, unfortunately, sometimes people will make excuses. They say, I can't be happy without eating chicken. I've been doing it for a long time, and I'm pretty darn happy. In fact, I'm much happier than I was back when I was eating chicken. We can spend the rest of our lives talking about this stuff, so we will, okay? <laughs> yeah, what's your name? Uh, Emily. Emily, yes. subsidies to businesses that sell us meat and are able to do it so well, largely, not entirely, but largely because they're able to reduce the prices as a result of the subsidies that they get. That's big. Third, I think, does come down to consumer choices. I think it's important for us to make decisions as individuals we're trying to lead ethical lives at a certain point to say enough's enough. I'm not going to participate in a system that I know to be immoral. 
businesses, as we know, are trying to satisfy consumers to a large extent. Again, I don't think that explains everything here, but I do think it explains a lot of it. When people demand vegan alternatives, businesses often do change. I do think it matters. Yes, what's your name? Uh, Sammy. Sammy, yeah. So my question to you is, all right. All right. Ideal <laughs> scenario, right? Yeah. Uh, we stop eating meat altogether, mm -hmm. and we just let all the animals that are in these horrible slaughterhouses free. And these animals, they have, you know, they've been genetically modified. Let's take cows, for instance. They've been genetically modified. Their breeding has caused them to be perfect for meat. So they're very fat. They can't move around a lot. They can't really survive on their own. They're all going to yeah. go extinct, let's say, in 20 years. Probably not true, but let's say they do. Because of just how they have been bred to uh, be, right? Would it be ethical to let cows go extinct? I thought you were going to take it in a slightly different direction. And I'm going to address your actual question. But one question that we often get What would happen to the animals if we just let them run wild? Wouldn't they die in the wild? Yeah, many of them would. Which is why I'm not advocating letting them go, do whatever they want, and get killed. I'm advocating for the animals that are already in existence, that are under our care. I'm advocating a system in which we care for them until they die. We would view them as humans who are not necessarily capable of taking care of themselves. We would be caretakers for the animals that we've already brought into existence for humans to consume. I'm sorry. something similar to the way in which the best companion animals, or rather the companion animals that we treat with the most care are treated. It would be something like that. Look, I'm not interested in bringing beings into existence that are going to live lives of total hardship. And that's the case with a lot of the animals that we bring into existence. As you alluded to, many are genetically manipulated such that they're not able to live anything other than extremely painful lives. I would not see it necessary to continue to breed those particular animals. Yes. What's your name? Mine? Yeah. Zoe? Zoe, yeah. Um, so, I'm not particularly one way. I mean, so there are, in terms of cooking, there are traditional dishes and cultural practices that are passed down from generation to generation that bring together and bind families, especially in America with immigrant families. How, I mean, how would, is it, if, you know, is it, do we just get rid of those dishes and say, well, you know, you, you can't make them how they're supposed to be made because this is, you know, something that we're, you know, that is no longer appropriate to do, or, I mean, is there some kind of compromise? I love to modify dishes. All of the <laughs> best, I'm sorry? <laughs> then they're not traditional. I mean, they're things that, that you, like, something that you learn from your grandmother, and she learned from her grandmother, and she learned from her grandmother, that it was passed down through family, and to suddenly change it, I feel like it's disrespectful to that family and culture. What's your name? Zoe, yeah. Zoe, I, I think you're making an important point about the way that different cultures have been brought together as a result of the exploitation of animals. And it's condemnable. It's not to say that the people who do it are evil. I don't think I was evil most of my life, or have been evil most of my life. I did it. And you're right, meat often does bring people together. But whatever benefit
something comes from that, I do not view as significant enough to justify the mistreatment of animals. There are a lot of practices, I need not name them for a group as enlightened as this one, that for a very long time were viewed as traditional. Tradition in and of itself cannot justify engaging in what we know to be a really despicable practice. Yes? What's going on is that individuals in the global south are cultivating crops en masse to be sent to Europe and the United States in order to fatten up cattle for us to eat. Sometimes people love to say that veganism doesn't make sense because we'd have to cultivate too much soy. If you're opposed to cultivating soy more than we need to, then you should absolutely be vegan. Why? Because a lot of the soy we're feeding to the animals. People say that they don't want to destroy crops, which is why we shouldn't be vegan. If you're worried about destroying crops, you should absolutely be vegan. Why? Because most of the crops, again, we're feeding to the animals. Yes? I know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just wrote something about bugs, actually. I'd love to share it with you and okay. get your thoughts. Because I've been thinking a lot about bugs yeah. and where bugs factor into our consideration of the issues at hand here. Yeah. I am not opposed to the idea that there are degrees of sentience. Indeed, I think that there are. And I actually think that having an ability to plan ahead often will make it more likely for an individual to experience a lot of pain. Because if somebody comes at me with a machete and cuts off my leg, I'm not only dealing with the excruciating physical sensation of losing the leg, I'm also thinking about all the ways in which I might not be able to use my leg in the future. It's a profoundly disturbing emotional experience. I mention this in the context of insects because I think it's highly unlikely that insects conceive of themselves in the future in that way. That's not adequate for us to mistreat them, though. Then we have to ask, are they sentient? The answer that I've reached based on my research, is we don't know. It partially, I think it's quite possible that they are partially sentient. Here's what I mean. I think that maybe when they experience starvation, for example, they go through pain. But you'll find that when insects are participating in experiments in which they're subjected to an aggressor, Sometimes they will not try to squirm to get away from the aggressor. Sometimes when a limb is injured on an insect, the insect will continue to act as though nothing had happened. Whereas if you hurt a dog, a dog's leg for example, the dog is quite likely to limp. That's called pain guarding. If it's particularly sensitive, it makes sense that the animal in question would try not to use it. We pain guard also. If we hurt our legs and we break our arms, the doctor will tell us not to use those limbs for a certain period of time. Insects don't seem to do that. All of which is to say, 
if you need insects to survive, I think you should eat them. Yeah. Well, the question about, can I come back to it? Is it all right? Yeah. Yeah, I'll come back to it. Gotcha. I, I actually don't remember at this point who hasn't spoken. Who in the back here? Okay. Yes. Two questions. Yes. So we, earlier you were talking about um, injustices against human beings. So, for instance, you use like Chechnya as an example. So we shouldn't abuse queer people in the United States. However, this is just something that I feel, and I, and I don't have an argument for it. I want you to comment on it. I feel that as humans, we're all equal, and I know you said we're family, but that it's more of an injustice when it's kind of happening to your own. And I know that can be flawed, because then you can apply that to like race or gender or whatever it may be. But shouldn't we focus more on injustices that are happening to people? And then number two, if we're going to focus on animal rights, um, should we look at it from a more um, realistic um, stance in that overproduction of animals um, is also environmentally not good for the earth and humans as well? So instead of going vegan, how about regulating the meat industry and their practices and the amount of meat and the even vegetables, the excess of it, um, because a lot of it is just thrown away afterwards. So, yeah. In order to care about animal rights, you don't have to be an animal rights activist, whatever that is. But you do have to eat three times a day, no matter what your primary cause is. You do need to buy clothes. So all I'm suggesting is that when you're working on gun violence, when you're working on drug decriminalization, when you're working on the school to prison pipeline, and you have to take a break to eat, because we all do, all I'm saying is eat vegan. When you have to go buy new shoes, or a new belt, or a new sweater, don't buy leather, don't buy wool, don't buy down, if you can. And as I say, time and time again, people know their individual limits. If you are going to put yourself through more pain than the animal would have to go through in order for you to get satiated, then you don't have a moral obligation to be vegan. But I think we all have to be really honest with ourselves in asking what we are capable of doing. That's what I say in response to the question of whether we should focus on human rights also. I, I suppose it's not really an answer to the question of whether we should focus on human rights first. I say no, we shouldn't. We should do the two simultaneously, and we can. We can. As I said, you don't have to go out and talk to people necessarily about being vegan. One good thing that you can do to help is be vegan yourself, if you're capable of doing that. Or sign the petition to ensure that animals, as long as they're in their prison, are treated at least a little bit better. I think you also answered one of the questions you asked just about whether we have an obligation to care more about our own group. We can define our group in a lot of different ways, can't we? Donald Trump can define his group as the Trump family. There are chauvinists and jingoists and nationalists who will define their group as the United States of America and will say, everybody else can go to hell. That's not how I define my group, though. I'm interested in all sentient beings. They're all part of my group. <clears throat> was there one more question that you asked? I forget. Uh, it was about like being more realistic and how we approach it, like regulating the food sure. industry. Look, I'm all about pragmatic changes. If we can make the standards that we're holding animal exploiters to a little bit higher, I'll support it. I don't think it's adequate, but I'll support it. One is greater than zero. Of course, five is greater than one, if five is perfect. But yeah, I'm all about pragmatic changes. We have to move people in the right direction bit by bit. Okay, let's see. Yes. No, that was a Yes, yes, yeah, sure. So like we said that like we should focus on both like simultaneously, simultaneously. Simultaneously. At the same time. Um, but like, 
we're gonna do that, like, how can we teach people that already like oppressed humans like the importance of like respecting animals' rights and like not like if they can't like if they already violate humans' rights, then how can we like instill like a sense of morality when it comes to animals? I'm going to answer your question with a poem at the end. <laughs> okay? And if you feel that I have not adequately answered it, we will talk afterwards. All right? What's your name? Tyler. All right, Tyler. That's my promise to you. Yes? So, on the topic of sentience, I yes. think, personally, the way I understand it is that I see a difference between instinct and sentience. I think sentience is me driving is not just because I, it's not just a survival instinct that I want to be safe, but it's because I want to go home and have dinner with my family. It's like about, about setting long-term goals the way that you sort of explained earlier. I think that a lot of times, like going back to the cheetah and the gazelle, a gazelle, at least in my mind, does not run from a cheetah to like go have dinner or whatever, but it runs from a cheetah for the sake of survival because that's what its body naturally tells it to do. And that's an instinct that has been honed through genetics and through experience that like, that animal has an instinct to act that way, not necessarily because it specifically thought out the possible ramifications of doing that versus not doing it. So what, to what degree do you view that sort of natural instinct as the same thing as sentience? Most biologists and philosophers, who can get things wrong, I admit, have agreed that the animals that we consume regularly, the vertebrates at least, feel pain. I think babies feel pain. I don't know that babies can conceive of themselves in the future. I don't think babies make plans, but they still feel pain. There are certain humans that are cognitively impaired who might not be able to think of themselves in the future but they feel pain also. I suppose that the relevance of this question is that if animals are operating on the basis of mere instinct and aren't actually sentient, then do we really have any obligations to them? The answer, if that were true, would be no. I think that plants, for example, will respond differently in different environments by which I mean, it's been said that individuals who sing to plants are able to get their plants to grow more quickly. I don't know if that's true. In any event, I think that plants respond to stimuli. With that being said, they're very different from cows and pigs and humans. We have nociceptors, we have central nervous systems, we release opioids in response to adverse stimuli, we engage in pain guarding. There are certain signs that we are able to feel pain that I think are adequate for us to say that we have an obligation to some of the animals that we consume regularly. Uh. My question is um, related to what you just said about babies and sentience and feeling pain. Yeah. Have you ever thought about um, the connotations of your moral argument for a pro-life and pro-choice debate? And what do you think about that? Absolutely. Since I've gone vegan, I have become more pro-choice. I've always been pro-choice. But I feel now that I have the philosophical grounding necessary to justify why I'm pro-choice. Within about 18 weeks of gestation, that is more than the first trimester, the entity in a woman's womb is not able to experience pain and is not able to conceive of itself in the future. According to my reasoning then, it has no rights. I return to the table with which we began. This table cannot feel pain and cannot conceive of itself in the future. When we slap this table hit it around a little bit, we're not depriving it of something that it wants. If we put it in the furnace, 
we wouldn't be depriving it of something that it wants. It does not understand what it would mean to live until tomorrow, and it does not think that we are harming it by attacking it. I hope I don't sound glib or flippant here, but I think that a zygote is the same way. It doesn't care what we do to it. There are, of course, moral considerations that come into abortion with respect to the woman's suffering, but I don't think that an entity in the womb in the first trimester has rights. If you want to talk about well into the second and third trimester, we're going to have to save it for one more go-around. Is that okay? I, I, mentioned, I mentioned the first trimester because 98% of abortions in the United States happen in the first trimester. Is that adequate for now? Is that satisfying? Yeah. yeah. Someone in the way back here. Yes, in the blue shirt. Um, no, I was just wondering with with that, like, what, what's your thought about like eating like chicken eggs? Yeah. Chicken's eggs. Yeah. That's vegan. That's vegan. Not vegan. Yeah. No, I know, like, vegetarian, but that's still like vegetarian. Like, I don't eat eggs. Yeah, no, but like, what are you thought if you're talk similar to like the abortion debate? Like, can like. Yeah, I guess. Well, the eggs. Yeah. The eggs. Yeah. Well, the eggs. Yeah. So the eggs. Yeah. Are Right, so as Zoe's saying, the eggs that we eat aren't fertilized, so if we don't eat them, they're not going to become chickens. I'll say that my objection to eating eggs is that many of the chicks that have the misfortune of being born male in the egg industry are ground up alive. They're lacerated as soon as they're born, and a lot of the hens that we get our eggs from are genetically manipulated to produce more eggs in a year than their bodies are actually able to handle. I think that a genetically normal hen can produce something like 40 eggs in a year. A lot of the eggs that we eat come from hens that have produced something like 100 eggs in a year. That's my objection to eating eggs. Yes. Okay, two things. What's your name? Uh, Dad's Kanya. Okay, nice. yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> first it out the table. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. So I was one of the people who raised their hand in the beginning oh, yes. and okay. said that I would not think it's justifiable to torture people. Okay. So that, that reasoning comes from my religion, actually. Sure. Which says, even though you could, if it's your property, you could torture the table, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean you should. You should still respect okay. it. And it's, I think you agree with that, yes? I mean, that just because you have the table doesn't mean you should torture it. Because let's say, like, you didn't need your table anymore, you could give it to someone mm -hmm. who would have utility for a table. Absolutely. Well, are you finished? And or? that's my first thing. My second yes. thing is a, a hypothetical scenario. Yeah. So let's say you go, you go to vacation somewhere, rats completely take over your house. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're eating your food, they're having a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you come back. What do you do? Do you call the exterminator on them, or what do you do? Let's start with the first question. <laughs> Look, uh, I think in theory, as well as in practice, we cannot commit any injustices to the table as a table, by which I mean, if we destroy this table and prevent somebody else from using it, we might be harming the individual who could have used the table. If we worked really hard to build this table, and then we destroy it, maybe we're harming ourselves. We're not respecting ourselves and the labor that is necessary to create a table. But I maintain that when we destroy a table, we are not committing an injustice against the table. Would you agree with me there, or not quite? I, uh, sure, I mean, it's always in theory, so. Uh -huh. <laughs> Didn't mean to put you on the spot, I was just trying to clarify. With respect to infestations, there are organizations that have put together a lot of different procedures that can be used in order to deal with mice and rats in a humane way. I know 
that some of the glue traps that humans use in order to get rid of mice and rats can be really painful. So uh, I would be opposed to those methods. I'm going to have to find the exact methods for you, but uh, I there would not say that we could do whatever we want to the rats or mice. There's about we have about five more minutes, just to let you know. Um, all right. But but there's some sort of flexible time in the middle in which they could potentially ask more questions if okay. we were staying around. Great. Yes. What's your name? Tara. Tara. Yeah. So. So that the power imbalance between a human and an animal raises some difficult ethical questions. As we know, the pets that we have are reliant on us for everything. And if we forget to feed them, they go hungry. That moral inhibition that we might have is no reason not to adopt. But it might be a reason not to breathe. I'm going to have to think through this with you. Yes, my friend. Uh, I would um, typically in this uh, vegan, not even a debate, just the movement itself, yeah. um, a lot of it is to protect animals, which is very admirable, and I think it's the right one. And also, it seems that a plant based diet would be the best thing for our health yeah. as a country. But I don't see that. 
much um, in this debate. It seems to be a little more tailored to animals, and I think that a lot of Americans, frankly, don't care, but a lot of Americans care a lot about their health, and it's like this big challenge, like, why are we all fat? And it's very obvious, it's because we eat meat, you know? Do you think that it might be a good idea to try to humanize the vegan debate a little bit? There are a couple of points I'll make there. First, I think it's true that if you go vegan, you can be healthier, definitely. And if that is what it takes to get people to go vegan, then it's an argument that, of course, I'm willing to make. My hesitation there is that sometimes I have found that people who go vegan for health reasons are willing to cheat. If they don't have the ethical foundation that would be necessary for them to feel in every conceivable moment that there's a problem with eating animal products, then they're more likely to give it up. That's what I've found. I'd like to see some research on this particular question. It's what I've experienced, though, with vegans who say, I'm doing it for health reasons. I discover a few months later that they're no longer vegan. Whereas for me, until I hear an argument that convinces me that animals don't have rights, I'm going to be vegan. It's not something on which I could cheat, because the moral implications of this practice are constantly with us. But it could be a backdoor way to help. You know, Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Yes. And if that's what works, then I'm all for making that argument. Can this, can this be the last question?